I'd like to welcome you all to, uh, to the session of the um, amazing habitat that is Hedges. Um, my name is Rebecca Inman um, and I'm from FWAG, which is the Farming and Wildlife Advisory Group. And uh, I'll be chairing this morning's session. Um, and I'd just like to say, if you've got any questions resulting from other speakers, please do post them in the Q&A. Um, and we will try to answer as, as many as we possibly can. We'll have a couple after each speaker and then we'll have a sort of question and answer session at the end, depending on how much, um, how much time we have. Um, so with hedgerows, I mean, they are such an iconic feature of, of lowland Britain, um, but sadly have been sort of very underappreciated over the last few decades. Um, but however, as the, as the biodiversity crisis and climate crisis intensifies, um, they're becoming increasingly recognised as, you know, one of the single most important habitats on farmland. Um, so hopefully uh, the emphasis on them will be, will be sort of increased um, because they're multifunctional. They deliver huge amounts of ecosystem services, some of which we're going to talk about, you know, this morning, um, including diverse habitat for a wide range of species, sequest carbon, um, help... Uh, reduce flooding, prevent soil erosion, suck up nutrients and pollutants from the soil. So they do a huge amount for us um, in the countryside. But we are going to focus on three of those particular functions um, this morning. Um, so our first speaker is Megan Gimber. Megan is the key habitats um, project officer with us for endangered species. And uh, Megan is going to highlight the importance of hedgerows to wildlife. Um, and then secondly, we've got uh, Dr. Matthew Hax, who is an independent consultant. And Matthew has recently been appointed the head consultant to the Hedro Carbon Code, and he's going to talk about hedro carbon sequestration. Um, and finally, um, with an estimate of only about one in three of our hedgerows in good condition, our final speaker, Nigel Adams, is going to talk about how to manage um, for healthy hedgerows um, so that they can deliver all of these important and amazing services. Um, so Nigel is a self-employed contractor. He specialises in hedges um, and he's produced many articles, been on the TV, been on the radio and, uh, and produced two DVDs on the subject. Um, so I think uh, we'll go straight in and um, start with Megan. Um, right, so I am Megan Gimber and I work for a charity called People's Trust for Endangered Species, where my main focus is hedges, um, and it's fair to say I am a bit of a hedge nerd. This morning I'm going to talk a little bit about how amazing hedges are for wildlife, before moving on to understanding why this might be the case, given they are technically a, a man-made habitat, um, and then finally I'll look at what makes a great wildlife hedge. But first, some context. So sadly, we are facing a triple threat, as Rebecca said, um, of biodiversity crisis, an environmental crisis, and a climate crisis. Um, and all the graphs that I care about are currently still moving in the wrong direction. Um, and of course, while hedges won't single-handedly save us from all of this, they can be a really important tool in our toolkit. Obviously, 70% of the UK is agricultural land. So what we do within that is hugely important for our wildlife. And hedgerows are incredible for wildlife. So George Eustace recently described them as the single most important ecological building block left in this country. Um, and perhaps for once, you won't hear me disagree. Um, one study published in British Wildlife counted 2,070 different species in just an 85 meter stretch of hedgerow in Devon. 2,070. If you were to record one per day, that's over five and a half years worth of different species. And the vast majority of these were insects, um, but of course we know how important insects are to everything else up the food chain. And the author of this study, the brilliant Robert Walton, um, says that even this mind-blowing figure, he believes to be an underestimate of the true number, as he was only counting species you can see with the naked eye um, and recognizes that some groups were also undersampled. So this was just an 85 metre stretch of hedgerow in Devon. So think what they might be able to hold nationwide. So how do they do it? Well, for wildlife, hedges provide three main roles. So firstly, they provide a physical home. So from 
nesting birds, hibernating hedgehogs, dormice and other small mammals to insects like beetles and butterflies. It's fairly well known that hedgerows help our native pollinator species by providing forage throughout the year, which helps them, supports them even when our crops aren't in flower. But actually what's less well recognised is the fact that hedges also needed to provide a physical home for things like pollinators. This can be both summer breeding sites or crucially as uncropped land for them to overwinter in. We have and we need a huge diversity of pollinator species. Um, and so they benefit from the huge diversity in nesting opportunities that our hedges provide. And similarly, hedges provide understood habitat as home for many populations of other beneficial insects, such as predatory spiders, ground beetles, parasitic wasps and hoverflies, um, which can do a really good job helping control our pest species within the fields. So again, these live in the many varied niches in a hedge um, and then travel into the fields when there might be a glut of something like aphids or something. Um, secondly, hedges are a really good complementary habitat. So this is one that's not necessarily home, but plays an important role in, in the life cycle. So this could be for food, um, for anything eating leaves or berries or insects or anything hunting small mammals, um, or it could be shelter, shelter from predators or shelter from the elements whilst out foraging. So things like barn owls will hunt alongside hedgerows. Then we've got those glorious winter visitors at this time of year. Things like field fairs, red wings, which all come here to gorge on the fruit that our hedges provide in the winter months. Um, a massive 84% of our farmland bird indicator species make use of hedges, but it's actually only about half of them where this is their physical home. The rest use them primarily for food and shelter. Um, and lastly, and importantly, um, they're, they're used as wildlife corridors to help connect populations that would otherwise be isolated and vulnerable. So corridors play a role for many species that are at risk from habitat fragmentation. Um, and fragmentation is thought to be a limiting factor to the distribution of some of our species in the UK, but it's even thought to be a threat to survival of others. So again, this is important for bats, for flying insects, um, for dormice, for hedgehogs, all sorts of things. Um, and some species may use a hedge just for one of those one of these three functions, um, but others use all three. Uh, bats are a really good example. Uh, I was once told that bats need three things to thrive in any habitat. They need a roosting site, a safe commute, and insects to feed on. And hedges and hedgerow trees can provide all three. And again, this reflects their use as a home, as a food source, and for connectivity. So about Three quarters of our bat species will roost in trees, so hedgerow trees are particularly important, um, but they also use hedgerows to travel between the roost sites and their feeding sites, as well as exploiting the hedges insect population. Uh, dormice, I think, are another good example, um, using hedges as a home, as food and as corridors. Um, we normally think of dormice as a coppice woodland species, but actually hedgerows are also capable of sustaining breeding populations of dormice. But to do this, they need to be healthy. So they need to be fairly large and they need to be species rich. Um, and the reason they need to be species rich is actually dormice eat a variety of foods and this changes throughout the year. So this means they need a variety of species growing in the hedge to actually fully support them. And of course, being arboreal creatures, um, they don't, they prefer to travel through branches and, and don't really like um, traveling across the ground. So it's actually hedges that provide the safest way for dormice to cross our countryside and stay connected within all the other populations. So sadly with dormice, we've lost about half of our dormouse population since the millennium. Um, and we know that they've gone extinct from 17 counties in the last hundred years. So it's, it's fair to say they are in a bit of trouble. Um, but one benefit of using them as a keystone species like this is that if we aim to get hedges right for dormice, which are, quite frankly, uh, fussy little things, um, we will have created a habitat that can actually support a broad range of other species as well. Um, and similarly, hedgehogs use all three elements of a hedge, so they will live, nest, hibernate at the bottom of a hedge, they'll feed on invertebrates um, at the base of the hedge and in the margins, um, and they also use hedgerows to navigate the landscape, as they like to follow linear features, um, where they can also sort of seek the shelter when needed. 
So hedges are a, a, a man-made and a man-managed habitat. So it may seem odd that they are this rich in wildlife, um, but while they aren't actually a, a natural habitat, actually in structure, they're what we call an ecotone. And this is where two or more habitats sort of overlap. And in this case, their structure mimics rich habitats that you'll find at a woodland edge. And this means for hedges, we have overlapping elements of woodland, flowering scrub and grassland. And while they may not replicate any of these habitats fully, it does mean they're capable of supporting many species from each of them, like 80% of what we would normally call woodland bird species. And for some species, this mix is actually greater than the sum of its parts, because some things are dependent on all three of these elements at once. So um, a good example is the song thrush. It will sing from hedge trees, nest in the dense hedge structure. Um, it will feed on snails and worms from the hedgerow base, um, especially if you've got any good wet ditches, um, before moving on to hedgerow berries later in the year. And all of these components are essential. Um, also dormice, they will feed from the flowering and fruiting scrub. Then they will also feed on ash keys and insects from hedgerow trees. Um, they weave breeding nests in the sort of dense protection of the scrubby structure itself. But then they'll make winter hibernation nests at ground level, probably in the tussocky grass of the, of the hedge margin. So again, all of these elements are absolutely crucial. Um, things like the brown hair streak butterfly, they of course lay eggs on young hawthorn stems. They use the shelter, the, the sheltered side of a hedge to gain the body temperature to fly, sort of unbuffeted by the wind. Um, and then they'll congregate around big, big hedgerow trees, particularly ash trees again, um, to mate. Um, and lastly, another, another, another group, uh, deadwood dependent beetles, now increasingly rare, they really require the deadwood at the center of old trees as larvae, but then they feed on the flowers of hawthorn and other scrub and pasture species, such as elder and hogweed, um, when they emerge as adults. Um, even many things that are classified as woodland species, you'll actually tend to find more frequently in woodland glades, in rides or woodland edges, where you have this sort of extra, extra structural layer. And actually, in fact, the closer you look at all of our native ecology, the more species you'll find thrive in this woodland edge habitat structure. Why? Well, an alternative theory to the closed canopy theory, which is the one we were all taught at schools, that a squirrel could um, merrily hop from tree to tree, lands and to John O'Groats, is that the pre-agricultural wildwood of this country was actually more of a mosaic than that. And this mosaic, of course, had plenty of woodlands, um, but it also had glades. It had areas that were open with scattered trees in scrub and pasture, all of which was kept more open by herds of large herbivores. And of course, things weren't neatly sectioned off as they are today. There was no fence line to neatly divide woodland from grass. So basically, there would have been much more of this woodland edge habitat structure. Uh, and of course, it was all in flux. It was all at different stages of succession as herbivores sort of crashed and crunched and browsed vegetation as they move around the country. And in this way, that mosaic was dynamic, dynamic across time and across space. So where herds had passed through, pasture would have been grazed, scrub plants will have been browsed down a bit, um, and some may even be knocked over by some lumbering big herbivore with an itch. Um, in, in areas that were less frequently visited, scrub will spread out and pave the way for new tree establishment too. So if this habitat combination is what a lot of our ecology adapted to, it may help explain why the cultural habitats, the man-made habitats that mimic this structure, so things like hedges, wood pasture, traditional orchards, are so rich in wildlife. So if anyone tells you that hedges aren't important because they're just a man-made invention or they're not natural or old, um, I would say just ignore them. Um, and of course, with hedgerows, we have confined this habitat structure to, to narrow corridors. We, of course, can't let them endlessly encroach into all of our fields. We, we do also need to eat. Um, but while we sort of may have lost that sort of spatial dynamism, we can still ensure it keeps this magic habitat combination at this valuable stage of succession through changing how they're managed through time. 
So again, if much of our wildlife adapted to thrive in this habitat structure, and maintaining this habitat structure is dependent on some level of disturbance, then we can use this to inform how we manage our hedges, both to ensure their very structural survival, but also so that they can be the best habitat for wildlife in the meantime. Um, and conveniently, this is a way of managing hedges. It's no new thing. Um, it's actually the way we had been managing hedges for centuries. I won't go into it too much because Nigel will cover this much better than me later on in the session. Um, but what I will say is that when, when young, most of our scrub species respond to the growing tips being cut off by occasional light trimming, um, as they would have done to the occasional animal herd browsing by putting more growth, more effort into branching growth, like a, like a puffer fish. Um, and done well, this can create an amazing density of growth which provides fantastic shelter for nesting birds and mammals, but of course can't be done too often or for too long. And then of course, most of our scrub and tree species respond to laying and coppicing as they would have done to being knocked over by some large herbivore by sending out shoots from the very bottom. Um, and this can reset that sort of cycle of succession, ensuring that this magic <laughs> habitat structure combination isn't lost. Okay, so I think that's probably enough of a, of a ecological history lesson. I will move on to um, having a closer look at the structure of a good hedge for wildlife. So first of all, I'd say a mix of different plant species is fantastic. Hedges with more plant species have a higher diversity of invertebrates and birds. Um, and partly this is because each plant will have something that specializes on feeding on it. Um, but also because it tends to mean you get a better year round availability of food sources. They all flower and fruit at slightly different times. I'll add to that actually that most of our hedge plants blossom and fruit on second year wood. So even if you have a hugely diverse mixed species hedge, if it's trimmed to the same point each year, you'll cut most of the flowering and fruiting potential off, which massively reduces how useful it is to wildlife. Uh, next up, the size of a hedge. So generally, increasing the, the height and the width of a hedgerow tends to increase the diversity and the abundance of wildlife within it. So not only do wider and taller hedges provide more hedge physical volume, um, but actually also increases the complexity of this habitat. Um, and evidence shows that larger and more complex hedges provide better shelter for foraging birds um, and even reduced predation for nesting birds. Um, I often get asked what the optimal size of a hedgerow is for wildlife, but this is impossible to answer. Um, as Nigel, I'm sure we'll discuss later, hedges are best, best managed on a cycle and you can't keep them to any one size. So I tend to just say generally bigger than it was the year before or bigger on average within its life cycle. Um, then we've got structural complexity. So some species, like I mentioned, with things like the, the song thrush and, and dormice, they actually need several hedge features throughout their life cycle. You can take this a little step further too, given that different species have slightly different needs from a hedge. Ideally, we want to see many different hedge structures represented across a landscape at one time. Then we've got connectivity. So hedges that don't have large gaps um, and hedges that do connect other habitats are particularly good for this wildlife connectivity, connecting up all the different other uh, patches of, of habitat in the country. A margin at the base of a hedge not only protects the roots of the hedge shrubs and trees from disturbance, um, but it's also great for wildflowers, for grasses, um, which in turn are amazing for foraging and nesting birds, small mammals and insects. Um, some hedges might also have a ditch um, and wet ditches are especially good because they mean you, you might have a new set of plant species that can grow there and a new set of, and an extra abundance of invertebrates too. Likewise, hedge density extending to the ground um, is crucially important for shelter, for nesting birds, insects, reptiles, small mammals, um, hedgehogs, etc. Unfortunately, the base of a hedge can actually grow, grow thin um, through grazing damage, over trimming, shading, um, and this actually can act as a good indicator that a hedge, hedge might need some rejuvenation. 
Um, and last, but very much not least, um, hedgerow trees. So over half the priority species associated with hedgerows are dependent on hedge trees. They provide song posts and territory markers for important bird behaviours. They provide nesting opportunities for birds, bats and more. Um, and also in a year where your hedge has been cut, um, hedge trees will still provide the flowers and fruits that a recently cut hedge itself can't so well. Um, old trees, especially like these wonderful old pollard trees that you find in, in ancient and boundary hedges, provide really valuable dead wood habitat for all our really rare dead wood dependent species. Um, we don't know much about our, our separate species. We know we've got about 2000 dead wood dependent insect species in this country. Um, uh, and we know that at least 320 of these are known pollinators. Um, so it is a very important group um, to look after. Sadly, uh, we, we lost a huge number of trees to Dutch elm disease. Um, we're in the process of losing more to ash dieback and we're not establishing enough new hedge trees to accommodate these losses. So the left hand of slide of this, um, of this slide shows an old ordnance survey map and beside it is the satellite image of what this land looks like now. So obviously there's a couple of hedges gone there, but what I think is just as striking is the loss of mature hedgerow trees, which are those sort of individually marked blobs on the left hand side, um, which are you know, individually indicated on this old map um, and almost all gone as seen in the satellite imagery today. Um, but in a time when tree planting is all the rage, I'd say establishing trees in hedges is a no brainer. Um, it doesn't take any land out of production. They form open grown trees, the benefits for wildlife, which could be a whole, whole talk in itself. Um, they, you can manage them for timber, for wood fuel, for additional crop production. You can coppice them, pollard them. You know, they're, they're very, very versatile. Um, and you can even establish them free through natural regeneration. Um, just either tag suitable young candidates and spare them from the trim, or you can leave a couple of good stems when you next lay or coppice the hedge. And actually, this this method of increasing tree cover has added benefits of preserving genetic diversity present in your local tree populations. And genetic diversity is a crucial defense of any species against the unknown threats of the future. So one oak might have genes that may make it naturally better in a drought condition. Another oak may be naturally better able to tolerate floods. And a third may have some natural resistance to whatever new tree disease may be on the horizon. So again, preserving this inherent genetic diversity in our hedges uh, should be a priority. Sadly, we went through some dark decades of hedgerow loss, incentivized hedgerow removal, I should say, um, where it's estimated we lost up to about 50% of hedges. And when we look at the trend in species that depend on hedgerows, it doesn't paint a pretty picture. So this is the trend for farmland bird indicator species. Um, and remember that 84% of these depend on hedges in some way or another. Similarly, half of our dormouse population has been lost since the year 2000, about the same in our rural hedgehog populations, and sadly, similar declines across the board. So now I'm, I'm not gonna sit here and say that's all down to hedges. We know there are several other factors contributing to these declines. Um, but given these species all depend on healthy and well-managed hedgerows, making sure we can provide these could be a well-needed lifeline for those species. And I'm glad to say that the outright removal is largely well behind us. Um, and I'm now seeing more hedges being planted than ever, which is absolutely fantastic. Uh, what I would say is it's worth remembering that what we have now shouldn't be considered a baseline that new hedges don't adequately replace the value of old ones and won't do for a little while until they've matured. Um, and given the historic loss, it's more important than ever that our remaining hedges are kept healthy. But what's now evident is that the way we manage existing hedges is of utmost importance, both to the health, the wildlife value, and even to their own future. Obviously, some hedges are in better shape than others, um, and this has a huge impact on their capacity to sustain wildlife um, and even their capacity to act as effective wildlife corridors. Um, so the level of fragmentation showed in this slide obviously makes it nearly impossible for wildlife to use these hedges for any of their three main 
wildlife uses. Um, and if that sounds like a depressing note to end on, that's because it's not the end. Um, luckily, hedgerows at almost all stages of their life and in almost all conditions can be brought back into being big, blooming, bountiful, wildlife filled, healthy hedges. Um, and later in the session, Nigel will explain all. And of course, even if you didn't give two hoots about the wildlife in your hedges, um, healthy hedgerows are still in our own best interests, as, Re as Rebecca discussed earlier on in the session. We're becoming increasingly aware how valuable they are, both for our farming as well as in our battle against climate change. So hedges provide shelter, shade, diet diversity, biosecurity, all of which are important for our high animal welfare standards, as well as for rearing healthy, profitable livestock. Um, but they also provide a windbreak. They can help us reduce pesticide use. They can provide pollinators to help pollinate our crops. Then of course, there's you know, less quantifiable but extremely important benefits, such as our privacy um, for tourism and our sense of place. Um, and then things like reducing soil erosion, reducing flooding, um, reducing air and water pollution. And of course, they also do soak up carbon, which I think is a good time for me to end this talk um, and hand over to Matthew. Thank you. Matthew, I think we're just going to take a couple of questions from um, uh, for Megan. We've got a couple um, in the Q&A. Okay. Um, so I've got one, Megan, is, this is from Marilyn, is flail cutting such a bad thing? Oh, um, I would say, I would say no. Um, I, people expect me to think that the flail is an awful thing being a hedge conservationist, but um, I, I, it, it's, the, it's the way you use it. Essentially, um, it's, it's not, it's not what you, how you cut your hedge. It's, sorry, it's not, it's not the machines that you use to cut your hedge, it's how you do it. So I would say if you're using a flail to cut slightly bigger each time, you can actually create a really decent, good wildlife hedge that's sort of thick and, 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 and structural. Um, and also how frequently you use it. Just because you're using a flail, which is a very useful, convenient tool, doesn't mean you have to cut right back down to the nub and doesn't mean you have to cut exactly every year. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily the flail, I think it's how it's used. We can definitely still use modern technology, we need to, we don't have, we don't have the manpower to do it by hand anymore, um, but it's about the sort of the, the, way, the way we approach it. But I'm sure Nigel will, will, will give much better information about this in his part of the talk. And, and one quick other one, which um, we can do a plug for Hedgelink, but Holly is asking, where is the best place to get advice on hedges for livestock forage, please? And what is not safe, what's not good for what animal? Is there a good book or website or organisation which we can search through? There is, but I can't think of it on the top of my head. Hedgelink, definitely. Um, but there is there is one specifically for animal browsing, but I can't think of it off the top of my head. I will um, see if I can think about it by the end of this session and put it in the comments. Yeah, we can look that up and post it. There has been research on looking at sort of foraging plants um, from hedgerows and trees. So. Yeah, looking at the different protein levels, the different micronutrients. Yeah, all sorts absolutely. Of stuff. You know, it's so much evidence to show that actually having availability of browse can have a huge benefit on, on animal health. Brilliant. Thanks, Megan. OK, handing over to Matthew. Great, thanks. Yeah, so, um, so I'm going to talk about hedgerow carbon sequestration. Um, with a spotlight really on what we can do with existing hedges, but also include all, all the sort of latest evidence that we have um, and some of the uh, interesting opportunities that are now starting to emerge. So as Megan sort of described a little bit, um, hedgerows really they're a man-made construction um, effectively to distinguish field boundaries and to help retain livestock or prevent livestock from getting into crops. Um, but nowadays we're appreciating hedgerows for so much more um, uh, cultural value and for want of a better expression, ecosystem services, biodiversity, habitat, etc. Um, but more and more for the carbon storage. And um, this is definitely a very hot topic. It was picked up by the Net Zero report as a high ambition option 2019. Um, they suggested increasing the length of hedges by 40% um, in the UK and converting 30% to management for wood fuel would sequester 0.3 megatons of CO2 equivalent by 2050. And we'll just keep a, a little eye on these figures in the background. 
Um, so the NFE's response um, was uh, to, to in a sort of a sort of campaign response was that enhancing existing hedges and new planting could actually sequester 0.5 megatons of CO2 equivalent per year. Um, and then get into the detail of how these kind of things could be achieved. So they thought it could be done through uh, the new environmental land management scheme, particularly. Um, a lot of options for farmers really just to volunteer into schemes like championing the farmed environment, and things that you might want to do voluntarily on your farm. Um, but if we could obtain some form of carbon price or carbon trading, then that might be another incentive to, to start changing what we're doing. Um, very, very recently, the Campaign for Protection of Rural England launched a hedge fund report showing all the benefits of hedgerows um, with a description on um, hedgerow carbon sequestration. And again, they've picked up that this time they're talking about extending the hedgerow network by 40%. So picking up not just the length of new planting, but the width of hedges as well is important. Um, and another comment they put in, really, a recommendation to extend the legal protection for more hedgerows, um, because as quickly as we're planting new hedgerows, we might be losing old hedgerows or neglected hedgerows at the back door, maybe to development or, or just sort of general neglect. Um, and they recommended that um, no more than 50% of hedgerows should be coppiced for wood fuel and no more than 5% a year on a farm, so it's basically a 10 year kind of rotation. Um, and encouraging hedgerows to grow taller and wider. So a lot of the information and modeling on hedgerows has actually been drawn from woodland in the past. Um, there are some subtle differences. Obviously the main way we're sequestering carbon is through the growth of the woody plant. Um, so that, that is similar, but traditionally woodlands are really looking at trying to um, get timber production from them, not always the case, but that affects how they're managed. Um, slightly different techniques, you know, thinning and spacing that aren't relevant to hedges. Um, and we've got a lot of data and information about hedgerow, about woodland, which is because there was an interest in productivity. Well, up until now, there's really been no interest in hedgerow productivity. Farmers may be aware of particular hedges which are growing very fast, but um, there's just nothing like the amount of information or data that we have on, on woods. Um, they're different because there's less limitations on, on the light, um, there's less shading. Um, their management is slightly different, so we do share coppicing with woodlands, but hedges, they can be laid, they're frequently flailed. These are diff different uh, management techniques. And they're actually, I think they're a very efficient carbon store for the amount of land they take up because they're actually a very dense intertwined structure. And although these stems may be smaller than, than those in the woodland, um, the kind of figures I found when I was sampling was 81,368 stems per hectare. Um, so quite a, quite a different structure. So it's been um, contended in the past that maybe hedgerows are carbon neutral. And this is because if we look at the pictures on the, on the left, our hedges are always growing. And this is something that, say, Nigel will be going through as well later on. But if we're not managing our hedge in some way, we end up with a line of trees, which I'm treating as a different structure. Um, or maybe in order to try and control this hedge, we really overflail it and overmanage it and we end up with something like the picture in the bottom left and eventually we end up having to coppice this or maybe lay the hedge and we remove all the material and traditionally this material was burnt in the field so overall on a period of time we've accumulated some carbon but we have then burnt it off and sent it back up into the atmosphere so there's there's carbon stored in the system which is storing more carbon compared to a, a crop but um, it's sort of cycling around. So one of the first sort of things, and this is, this is the sort of the system view is, is kind of where I'm really interested. So one of the first things that came out, and this is uh, a couple of people looking at this, but particularly report from uh, the Organic Research Center, the Tweecom project. And what they found was using 
uh, hedges for wood fuel, the main benefit was actually the offsetting of the fossil fuel that the hedge um, material replaced. So that's definitely one thing that can be done. Um, and then the other thing is generally what, what can we do in the system over its period of time? Because if we're doing the same rotation, managing it the same way, we're not really making any changes. So uh, just the way I'm trying to illustrate that, um, if we take these graph or columns at the front, um, the blue, that might be our existing arrangement of hedges on a farm or in a landscape. And what we might be trying to do there is to sequester more carbon over time is we're moving away from having so many hedges in poor condition and we start having more hedges in a flail, maybe flail, but in a good condition, bulkier hedges and moving some hedges perhaps into a long rotation coppice. So I was fortunate a few years ago to be able to actually sample some hedges, get some real data. Um, these were three triennially failed hedgerows at the Royal Agricultural University's farm. And um, I looked above ground, uh, below ground, and also at the um, soil organic carbon. So I was trying to get some, some real raw data to this. Um, so what I found was 40 tonnes of carbon per hectare in these hedges at 2.7 metres high. Uh, so there's not a, a, um, it's a sort of unit measure, a hectare of hedge doesn't truly exist, but it's, it's, it's the way you can relate that figure back to different lengths and widths of hedges. Um, but perhaps more, more usefully, we're starting to get um, an idea of sequestration rates. And we had um, a hedge that had been incrementally flailed. So in the picture on the right, you've got two red lines where the height had been increased by flailing it at different, different heights over time. So the difference we had with 70 centimetres, we gained 6.2 tonnes of carbon per hectare. And potentially over that period of time, there was actually slightly more because that the top of that hedge would have been flailed to achieve that height. Um, I think what I found the most interesting was actually below ground because nobody looked at this at all before. And we found a root to shoot ratio of nearly one to one. Um, there was a large amount of biomass or carbon stored in the root crown and the stump, um, which makes some sense when you think about how we're managing hedges. As I said, at some point they're being coppiced or laid, that um, root stump would potentially support a, a main stem, a sort of full grown sort of tree, but we're periodically taking that top growth off um, and the plants responding by pulling up all these smaller stems, um, but the stump and the root crown is still growing to a certain extent. So um, yeah, fairly substantial amount at that, that point. Um, and the outcome from this work was really that wider hedges were more efficacious at storing carbon than taller ones. So what I mean here is that if I had um, one of my hedges and we just had 1.6 meters increase in height, it gained two tons of carbon per kilometer. And then a similar hedge, which had been allowed to grow 1.6 meters wider, had acquired 7.5 tons of carbon per kilometer. And then on top of that, if we allowed that to go up another 1.6 meters, um, it acquired another 4.2 tons of carbon per kilometer. So there's no real reason to have quite such narrow, skinny hedges. And the carbon sequestration allowing wider hedges is, is going to be a good thing. Um, on our site, it had occurred in a sort of fairly natural region type of way. The um, blackthorn had grown out laterally, which is quite common, certainly in the south. Um, and this has been uh, researched as being Blackthorn's natural response to light competition. So it struggles to compete with Hawthorn directly with light, and it tends to grow out from the hedge, and that, that's just how its, it's natural habit is. Um, I think, well, I will quickly mention soil organic carbon. This was a little bit trickier because we had some um, complex results because of different soil types on the farm. Um, but this is just to sort of illustrate that we started to see differences in soil organic carbon between the hedge and the field from 15 centimetres depth onwards. Um, it really begins to show from 30 centimetres onwards, but as I said, it was a complicated site because the 
uh, arable area was on a, a Cotswold Brash or Sherborne series soil, so we were starting to hit the bedrock, and hence there's no more carbon after 30 centimetres where the crop was. But the interesting thing is whether we were seeing another effect, an advantage of hedges, because the depth of soil was so much more where the hedge was. Was this just a sign that we'd lost a lot of soil from the arable area over time, or had soil been built up in around the area of the hedge? Um, but either way, another, another positive. Um, and then glad to say we are now starting to see much more sort of data and information coming across. The Leeds University Resilient Dairy Landscapes Project, they looked at 32 hedges very recently, um, still um, waiting for the, the uh, published in the scientific journal, but they've been able to issue some um, briefing notes and results. Uh, very encouraging, 39% increase in soil organic carbon beneath hedges compared to a field or fields, um, as we expect, but we, you know, we need to see these things proved and evidence that the older hedges had more soil organic carbon than recently planted ones. And I thought really just dropping down to uh, details at the bottom, most interesting thing, bearing in mind some of the figures we had at the net zero report of 0.3 megatons of CO2 by 2050. They um, projected their um, information and found that increasing the length of hedgerows by 40% would sequester 7.9 megatons of CO2 equivalent. Um, this would take some time to do, but uh, by 2050, I'm sure we could get there. So um, my recommendations on, on how you can sequester more carbon into your existing hedgerows. We can gap up and generally get this hedge to be more bulky. Um, I'm quite keen on incremental trimming as a way of gradually increasing the height of the hedge while still flailing. So we can go for taller hedges. Wider hedges where there's capacity, which I'll, I'll mention in the next slide a little bit, but I'm um, from down in deepest Devon, where we have very big, substantial hedge banks and pretty wide hedges already. So I, I would say generally there isn't much capacity for that in the landscape down here. Um, but some regions there certainly would be. Um, and another thing we can do is can we use the hedge for wood fuel in some way? Um, and can we discard? Um, any arisings from hedge laying or coppicing, uh, can we discard that on the site? Can we avoid burning in some way? So, although it will slowly decay, it's decaying slowly compared to, to burning straight away. Um, so, I mentioned about landscape capacity. Um, the CPRE did put in an objective to commission the research on where actually a 40% increase, increase in hedgerow extent could be planted. Um, the image there is actually still based on uh, countryside survey data from 2007. Um, so we, we may be a little bit out of date with that, but that's all we have at the moment. Um, and you can see the lighter coloured areas where there's less woody linear features, there's less density. Um, I think we can only talk really generally about it. It's generally going to be south east. Um, arable areas, I think, where we currently have quite skinny hedges that aren't perhaps serving many purposes, and that's an opportunity to bulk those up and for new, new planting. But as I say, it's, it is going to de depend on where you are and what land, your landscape capacity is for really improving existing hedges. Um, so the exciting stuff and the interesting things that are uh, uh, coming along. So Elm's still a pilot, really, uh, the sustainable um, farming incentive is, I think, inadvertently, there's there's an option to, to have wider hedges because previously, uh, I know there have been lots of farmers I've spoken to who've had problems with their hedge has gone too wide and they weren't receiving payments. But the description in Elm's is that a hedge can be five metres or less from main stem to main stem in the width. And I think that's a, a increase on, on the, there's two meters from the center line uncultivated. 
on either side um, in a previous sort of uh, cost compliance. So this it seems to me we've got a bit of an option to increase. I mean, how how far could we push the description of a hedge? I don't know. Nigel might have a comment on that. Um, and there's a basic option to leave 50% uncut each year. So we've got a sort of biannual cut that will help increase hedge height. There's an intermediate option, which uh, caught my eye, which is um, the incremental trimming that I mentioned of at least 10 centimeters a year. Um, um, yeah, I'm very glad I'm going to be working on the hedgerow carbon code with Professor Leek at um, the Allerton project, part of the Game Wildlife and Countryside Trust. They've secured funding for a pilot project. Um, we're just trying to establish a, a quality assurance standard. Um, it's very early days at the moment, but um, the exciting thing is that you know we're trying to find some way of um, obtaining a verifiable carbon credit or hydrocarbon unit, um, similar to what's been done with the Woodland Carbon Code. Um, it's initially interest is from uh, agri-food supply chain, so it's been described as insetting or you know, sort of offsetting within the supply chain. That's the initial interest. Um, where it will lead, I can't be 100% sure, um, but we, you know, we haven't got anything like that at the moment, and this will help to, to to find some sort of standards. Um, I think probably more like offsetting than open carbon trading. But as I said, I'm I'm just sort of speculating at this stage where that will go. So that, that will be good to get, get some standards in place, which we don't have at the moment. Um, interesting things that come out from that is how do you value and reward what's already been done? Because the obvious thing with any sort of incentive towards sequestering carbon is right that that incentive is going to be aimed at the people that improve the skinny hedges and, and plant planting new and yet a lot of work has already been done so how can we sort of reward that and then you know the things i'd sort of bring up here I don't necessarily have all the answers but how could we incentivize um that's using more hedges for wood fuel um, can we realistically discard uh, or chip brash after hedge laying in the field, is that actually a realistic thing that can be done? And perhaps uh, my most extreme <laughs> slide, really, the idea is that it's all picked up from conversations I have with farmers and conversations we have within HedgeLink of where we think things might go. Um, and we have to balance that, of course, with what effects that might have on biodiversity and, and hedge structure. So uh, within the Devon Hedge Group, I have a farmer who actually does use hedges for wood fuel who said well why have I got thorn in my hedges I don't use the hedges to keep the livestock in it anymore I use the vents for that so um why we, why do we have thorn in, in our hedges anymore so that sort of takes you through to the, the um purpose designed wood fuel hedge maybe that would be willow or poplar um what's the consequence then if we started having loads of hedges like that um, and then how do you balance that with public money for public goods, carbon sequestration, but at the same time, possibly an income from private finance for um, carbon sequestration. So all, all these things are in the melting pot at the moment. It might be quite interesting to sort of come back in, in a couple of years time and see what actually really starting to move forward. But, you know, a few years back, these, these were all sort of been pipe dreams. Now I can sense the momentum, the way that Questions are being asked within the NFU, et cetera. And the final one that has been sent to me uh, a couple of times is, well, maybe as a, as a farm or landowner, I'm just going to contract out the asset management. It's just, it's a hedgerow. I'm going to let the company manage it. Um, they'll get the benefits from carbon sequestration and any payments. Um, and I, I just sort of let that go. So these things, are, I bring them up really as topics for discussion, I think, really. I think uh, they're going to come about um, to what extent they will, I don't know. Um, so, yeah, that's bringing up, you up to date, I think, with all the things that are going on with carbon sequestration. I um, hope you found that useful. A few references. <laughs> and um, I think we'll just, yeah, stop sharing. There we go.
Brilliant, thank you, Matthew. That uh, highlights again the potential that we have with uh, with hedgerows. I've got a, a couple of quick questions um, for you. Um, one from uh, one that comes through in the chat, actually, from um, let me just from Becky Wilson. Good morning, Becky. Just asking about. Um, is there any um, data on the sort of carbon capture um, from cutting versus uh, uh, sort of hedge laying? Um, have you got any sort of data that, you know, splits those different management types? I could probably access some. Um, yeah, I mean, you've got to think that the hedge laying is probably still part of your management for that hedge, so that the consequence of the hedge laying, you're going to be removing some, you know, quite, you know, off the top of my head, I'll be thinking two thirds of the above ground biomass is probably gone. Um, yeah, I know, I, I know, Becky, I think we can probably have a separate conversation about that. That's great. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And, um, And is there um, is your study with the sequestration sequestration proportional to the increased increased size, you know, width and height, um, or greater? Um, so that's from Maureen. So in your study, was the sequestration proportional to the increased size, width and height? Um, yes, I think it's the short answer. Yes, because I mean I've got values in. in Tons of carbon per hectare. Um, are, are we? I suppose. I suppose the question. Yeah. I suppose that within that, you haven't got anything on that would show that. I mean, potentially, if you've got a really, really thin hedge, is it? I think what you're saying is it a kind of linear relationship? If it was really a really poor thin hedge and we scale it back, I guess we we haven't got that kind of model really. Um, we, I'm, I'm confident with what we've got with the existing information that we can scale it. Um, but there, there comes a point when that isn't going to be so accurate if you had a really, really thin edge, you can't scale it down. Okay, we've got more questions, but what we'll do, we'll go through more of the sort of Q&As at the end. So in the meantime, I'm going to hand over to Nigel, <coughs> who's going to talk about the all-important hedgerow management and how we keep our hedgerows healthy. Thank you, Rebecca. Hopefully you can hear me. I'm going to attempt to share my screen see how that goes how's that looking yep that's good great well thank you very much and two really really interesting um talks there um and what i'm going to concentrate on is the health of the hedge and that relates very much to the management of a hedge if we want our hedge to provide all the services we require from it then it really does have to be healthy in my opinion so as people have said i think hedgerows define our landscape in the last countryside survey the results of favorable condition were uh, varied, to be honest. About 50% of hedgerows um, were deemed to be in favorable condition, set against um, a, a range of criteria. But the harsh reality is when, when we narrow that down to the arable areas of uh, a farmland, only 12% of our hedges roughly were in um, favorable condition, managed hedges, that is. So we've, we've some way to go on how we manage the hedges. And our choice of management and our intensity of management is absolutely vital. I'm going to whiz through these slides because I'm trying to put an hour's talk into about 20 minutes. So I think we've got two main types of hedgerow in this country, the ancient species rich uh, patchwork quilt of, um, of, of ancient hedges, southwest Wales, etc. And then we've got the more recent um, Enclosure Act hedges, which happened between, say, 1750 and 1860. Very planned, very straight and angular and very often solely hawthorn hedges. And I think it's often the hawthorn hedges which create the most problems today. I'm going to be introducing the idea of a management cycle. Megan has mentioned it, so has Matthew. This is the idea that we cannot keep a hedgerow in any one given shape or form, that it has to be allowed to pass through. We, we can delay this journey, but it has to pass through a life cycle when we then have to step in and rejuvenate. It's like we're trying to keep that woodland edge that Meg talked about 
and we have to we have to manage, manage accordingly. So let's start off with neglected hedges. There was a range of hedges throughout the country. We've probably all seen hedges where we've received no management for many, many years. And whilst that still looks quite dense and um, uh, forming a good habitat, there's a danger that a hedge that is totally neg neglected will eventually literally fall down because the top weight of these things is, is too heavy. And things like hawthorn and blackthorn haven't got a long life cycle. They're woodland edge species. This is a really old hawthorn hedge here, an enclosure hedge. It is absolutely on its last legs there um, and gives us very few management options because all those stems will be old and senescent and uh, won't be able to lay them. And I don't even think they respond to cutting to ground level. It's been untouched for well over 100 years, I would say. And eventually nature wants to take that woodland edge, that hedge, back to being trees. That's, you know, it's like the climax um, cover, I suppose. And whilst hedgerow trees and lines of trees are very important for very, very many reasons, they don't actually come under that heading of, of hedges anymore. And they're perhaps not providing that shrubby, dense habitat for, 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 for the wildlife we've discussed. How do we stop hedges becoming a line of trees? Well, historically, they were managed, they were laid, they were trimmed by hand, as this picture shows. Um, and it's that trimming which gives us that thick, dense hedgerow, but we can't hold it at that stage forever. So hedges used to be trimmed by hand until, I guess, the 1940s, 1950s, when we started to invent these marvellous, weird-looking machines uh, to help us uh, to trim the hedges because farm workers were leaving the land, you know, to work in the cities and manpower wasn't so, so available. And that developed right the way through to the flail machine, which we've touched on um, a few moments ago. And as Megan says, fundamentally, there's nothing wrong with the flail machine. It is a wonderful tool. Um, we have thousands of miles of hedges on some estates. You know, it's a vast cost, many farms. It's a big cost that the landowner is undertaking to keep the hedge dense and, and um, um, you know, full of wildlife. But we can go terribly wrong with the flail machine. And it's my uh, view that um, we're over trimming in many cases. This is a well trimmed hedge. This is nice and wide. It, the machine is backing out slightly every single year, incrementally allowing that hedge to develop. It's thick, it's dense, and yes, it's tidy. And, and you know, we, we do, some people require sort of tidiness in the countryside, which we'll talk about more perhaps. But many, many hedgerows are looking like this. This is a typical hawthorn hedge, what I would call an enclosure hedge. Uh, it has been trimmed at the same height for many, many, many years, probably since the 1960s. And it simply cannot stand that regime. Literally, it has been cutting, being cut at the same height, like not up or down, the same height every time and uh, all the bases of the stems are becoming rotten. Another example, I'm going to show you a few examples of this now. And in there, that diagonal thing there, we call the pleacher. That's when we're hedge laying. That's a sign that this hedge was uh, laid once. We know, therefore, that it was uh, had many, many stems. It was tall and it was laid down. And I know Megan talked about the, she used the word complex uh, when she talked about the, the, the density of a hedge. And it's interesting. We call it a pleacher. They come from the same word, pleacher, plesse. It's a the Latin word. And that's where the word plex comes from in complex, actually. I learned recently, which I find quite fascinating, that by laying, we're making something more complex by pleaching it. Here's another one. This was actually sent to me the day before yesterday by a farmer actually in Shropshire saying, what can I do with my hedge? I'm getting a bit worried about them. Um, and this is just, you know, a sad indictment of where we are with these hedges. They're absolutely rotten at the base. I don't know whether this hedge has been sprayed at the base. I don't know what. Being cut at the same height, giving us no ecosystem services whatsoever. This one almost defies words, really. <laughs> yeah, it's just... There we, are, there we have it. It's being trimmed at the top. It's being grazed at the bottom. It's got no floor at the base. It's just dreadful. And this is... I show this, it's not necessarily a hedge, but it's a sycamore tree that's been cut at the same height for so long that it's now forming this kind of flat top table that's in, in the Lake District. So I show all these pictures just to stress this over trimming thing, because I think it's a big threat to our hedges, this constant over trimming at the same height. This one, again, is being grazed at the bottom, cut at the top. Now, I liken it to this. I put my hedge here in a steel box. I think they're called gabion boxes. They're often used to put stones into to the side of you know cliffs and stuff like that. Let's say we planted our hedge and we put this wire mesh cage around it. Well, for the first 
15, 20 years, maybe it would fill up and it would be lovely and dense. You know, we're cutting off every year. We're cutting off on anything that pops out of that box. We're cutting it off. So first of all, that box would fill up and it would be great. It would be lovely and dense. But after a while, the stems would start to contort. The stems get larger in diameter. The sort of bushy growth sort of almost goes up to the top because each of our trees there each of our bushes there wants to be a tree effectively and that is what happens that is exactly what we're doing when we flail at the same height and the same width year on year for 50 or 60 years that is the stress that we're putting on the plants that we have and that is the result it thins out things give up stems give up and there are almost no options of management with that and it's providing nothing at all and we've all seen the flail damage that is caused i'm not necessarily going to say it's going to kill the hedge there, uh, they recover amazingly well, but it certainly do let in a lot of disease. And you get this kind of gnarled, contorted knuckle, as I call it, at the cut line, which is a sure sign to me that that's the hedge telling you, please relax, please just give me a bit of space, please incrementally back off me now and let me recover and be a dense hedge once again. So here's a hedge which is trimmed. It's got lots of stems, which is really, really important when, when we look at a hedge in terms of management. We have to look inside a hedge, particularly in winter, and has it got a lot of stems, which gives us options. We could allow that to go straight up to be laid. You can see in the base, it's been laid in the past there, that the, the, the old pleach is there, but we could let that grow straight up to lay in say eight to 10 years. We could even step in and cut it to ground level now, and then it would re-sprout from each cut stump. But if we keep on cutting at that height, then we should know that that's going to go down and become one of those really poor hedges that I talked about before. So as a hedge starts to relax, let's say we decide to relax the cutting regime, we give it more space, we let it become a bit more wild and woolly. This is the sort of thing we, we might be after. A lovely hedge that's going to be flowering and blossoming every single year. It's got a few hedgerow trees along its length. So off it goes now, we've, we've let it go. We might be controlling it, we might be cutting that every two or three years, let's say, but we're allowing it to increase in volume and breathe. And you can actually turn some of those old gnarled hedgerows into something like this, just by backing off. So here's a hedge, if, I, if you can see my cursor, but just about maybe a meter and a half up, there's a dark shadow in those going along there. And that's where it was cut to for many years. And then the landowners let this hedge grow up. And so we have again, we have lots of stems. We have the option to coppice it there. We also that is perfect for hedge laying. So for those who don't know what hedge laying is, that hedge is great, but the animals can go in between those stems. So in many parts of Europe, we develop this uh, craft skill, if you like, called hedge laying, where we cut partially through the base of every stem in a hedge, lean it over, lay it over, and um, form this thick, dense yet living. Um, living hedge and there are many regional styles around the countryside. The cutting technique in each of our styles is the same. As you can see we start um, a little up the stem depending on the diameter of the stem. We start about three or four times higher than, than the diameter and then we thin it down so that on one side uh, we have just enough wood there to carry the sap up and down in, in the cambium layer and that, that, that makes the stem pliable and we're able to take it over and um, form this thick dense barrier there's another shot of the stems people are often surprised how much we cut through but that will live and you get new growth from the from that stump or heel as we call it so it's a completely living fence and that is a form of rejuvenation we're getting new growth from the base not only that we're actually leaving a wonderful habitat the very day we walk away and you'll get birds nesting in this thick dense hedge immediately the following spring so this is how we do it. We start at one end of the hedge, uh, nearly always the uphill end of a hedge. We lay things uphill and we move sequentially down the hedge, laying each one over and forming the laid hedge. And it's the way we finish the hedge that um, uh, it defines all the many, many local styles of hedge laying that we have. So I'm just going to quickly talk you through some of those. Sorry about the speed, but I want to pack a lot in. This is what's called a Midland hedge in the centre of England. Um, it has a clean side. This the field, this side would be in a field rotation system. This would be in the, in the, in a crop this year. And you can see all the brash, all the thorny bits on the other side there. And there would be livestock in the rear of that, uh, uh, the field behind there. That's the Midland style hedge, very tall, strong hedge. This is a Lancashire and Westmoreland hedge. It's a bit thicker and denser. It's from the sheep country of uh, Lancashire and the, and the Lake District areas. This is the Devon style, which uh, 
uh, grows on these big massive banks and is actually on two sides it's along the front edge of the bank there and, and there's another um, comb as we call it on the back side there all the cutting is the same there's about probably 30 35 styles that can be described of which about 18 or 20 are still still used i'm not going to show you them all this is a south of england style so the brush is on both sides of that hedge this is at a national competition believe it or not we have a national championship a national hedge laying society organizes and this is a style i developed uh, shall i say myself i call it the conservation style there are no stakes or bindings in it and it's ideal between two existing fences still neat very strong and an instant wonderful dense habitat there that hedge was probably about 15 foot high when we started and if you look in the bottom of old hedges, you can see signs of old hedge laying from many, many years ago, still there, still hanging on. This one has been laid over. That's now horizontal at the bottom. It's dropped down, but we've got new growth coming up off that stem and all those can be laid the second time around. And it's kind of like a perpetual sustainable fence, really. Perhaps we don't need that livestock uh, need anymore because we do have wild, wild, um, wire fences, but it was still providing that wonderful um habitat dense habitat for wildlife on a cycle we're rejuvenating the hedge so sometimes uh, folk don't want to lay the hedge it might be too expensive uh, for, for one reason we might want to produce some wood fuel some logs etc some wood chip and so we coppice the hedge we cut it to ground level and as megan suggested uh, these woodland edge species are very used to having this quite quite brutal management being knocked over by grazing animals in effect and they, they will re-sprout from the base and come up and form an, a new thick dense hedge and as I say it's possible to get a, a good source of, of, of wood fuel for your house or your farmhouse or whatever. Uh, more modern machinery has come in to help us this, this, this instrument is called tree shears it's like a giant pair of loppers or scissors and uh, with very overgrown hedges we can take that in on a digger and um, save the manpower and, and it's a much more efficient thing to do so we we must learn that we have to rejuvenate our hedges it's the single most important thing i think we can do for our hedges on rotation so that any time in the on a farm or indeed in the country there's going to be a mosaic of different heights um densities old hedges new hedges hedges being trimmed hedges not being trimmed every year etc and this is a following year after coppicing a hedge to ground level it was a very gappy hedge we put new plants in within these protection and spirals and you can just about see this is a, this is about the month of may we did the work in the winter and that's that stump is already starting to to shoot so it's a it's an opportunity as well to thicken up our hedges and start again so let's say we coppiced our hedge or we've laid our hedge like i have done here then that is the time when we can step in and actually trim them every year because as has been said before that sort of uh, cutting in effect grazing grazing forces the hedge or encourages the hedge to throw out much more side shoots to protect itself literally i suppose um, and that's the one time where we really can trim quite hard every year and i often take out a handheld machine like this but i use this picture because i've i've lent the trimmer up against the hedge and, and immediately i can start to train the hedge to this lovely sort of slight a shape which is much more beneficial for the for the growth of the hedge than the square box like thing so as soon as you, even from a coppice hedge you can start to train the hedge if you will uh, to grow it into this nice a shape which will be thick at the bottom wonderful habitat for nesting birds you can already see some berries on there that's uh, two years after hedge lane and we're here we are back to to the flower machine that hedge was laid many years ago but it's been allowed to grow on up very light trimming happening there. But even on a lovely hedge like that, you can see it is trimmed every year and there is no berries or fruit. Blossom can't set on annually trimmed hedges. It, as Megan says, it needs two, if not three years of, of, of the tip of the wood to be, to be uncut. And then we'll get all the berries and the fruit. And I was involved in a, a very large experiment looking at lots of hedges on, on different sites. And we studied this idea of incrementally cutting, that is, not cutting down to exactly the same height, especially when that knuckle has formed at a trim line, then back off it. Uh, <clears throat> and um, so you can you can cut annually, but just back off it. I mean, 10 centimeters has been quoted. It can be even less than that. And you'll get uh, berries every single year, not heaps necessarily, but you'll get some berries every single year uh, because there is some old wood there. And that hedge has been, that's about sort of five years after the of, of, of incremental trimming, just a little bit each year. It literally allows the hedge to breathe. It's like you're relaxing this constant stress on it. 
And then we can choose to not trim a hedge at all for a period. And then we get masses of blossom. That's what the each, you know, this is what the shrubs want to do. This is a blackthorn hedge, you know, absolutely late and really important. This is one of the earliest blossoms that comes out for those invertebrates that are, have just emerged and are desperate for a food source. And has been said before, <coughs> excuse me, then we get when the blossom is set, that hopefully will turn into fruit, vast array of fruit and um, uh, feeds the birds throughout the winter. So let's just, this just sums up this pressure, this life cycle, this, this way that, you know, we must recognize what we're doing. So top right hand corner there, we've got a hedge which is being trimmed, but has many stems. And if we keep trimming that hard to the same height, it will degrade down to that one on the top left. And at this point, I'd start to introduce this idea of a, a, the, the, a scale I developed, which, which, which scores a hedge between one and 10. And the top left hand there would be a one. It's poor, it's gappy, it's rotting. Uh, that's the worst kind of hedge you can have. So going back to the top right again, we can let that grow up. We can let that become untrimmed. That becomes bottom left there, which would be a number five on this scale. And if we just walked away from that and didn't do a thing, then we know that would, in effect, degrade. It would become either a line of trees or this hedge on the bottom right, which would just about be about to fall down. That would be either a nine or ten. And I find this um, life cycle scale really, really helpful. You can see I've got three colours there. Red, danger, uh, the sort of amber there, number three. The green is the healthy, four, five, six and seven. Um, eight again, a bit of a warning, and then you get up into the neglected hedges, the line of trees uh, and the overgrown hedges. And sorry to rush through this, but it is on the hedge link page. And I think Meg would like to say a quick word about an app that um, People's Trust for Endangered Species have, have, have come up with using this life cycle scale, but it is a wonderful way of, of, of recognizing exactly what you're doing with your hedges. Quick word on planting. The government wants us to plant 240,000 kilometers of hedge between now and 2050. I certainly hope we can come up with all the hedge plants, but it's worth remembering this. It's all very well planting hedges, but what are we going to do with them afterwards? And again, management is crucial. I see so many hedges. This one is almost exactly 20, 20 maybe 22 years old. It's been trimmed every year at the same height, and it's providing nothing for, for wildlife. So we must look after our newly planted hedges. There's, that's, you know, no self-respecting bird is going to nest in that, I don't think. So this is a hedge, same age, exactly the same age. There was lots planted at the turn of the century in the old stewardship schemes. And this is um, uh, my son looking at a hedge which we're about to lay, actually. That's been allowed to grow unchecked for 20 years. Two different hedges planted at the same time. So we can choose what we want to do with the hedges. Do we let it grow up like that? Or this is a, a, a compromise. Is this hedge has been trimmed every year, since, every year since it was planted, but they backed off. They've incrementally allowed it to increase in size. And this is a wonderful hedge. This is a 20 year old hedge, which is full of wildlife, has lots of berries and has lots of nesting potential in it. So coming to the end of my talk, sorry to be so quick once again, but I do lots of farm surveys around the country and I wander around these farms, estates, and, uh, and I'm looking sometimes at really a, a, a lack, a paucity of, of wildlife, but I come across what I call hotspots. This is in a big arable estate. And here I've come across this hedge, which is, is quite large, it's quite dense, it's got bramble over it, it's blossoming, it's got a bit of a margin there. And I can literally sense that this hedge is buzzing with insects, with life. There's little birds flying in and out of it as I walk down. And you know, it's so easy to obtain this, even from our completely ruined hedges. This is the sort of thing, if we want biodiversity on our land, this is another one. This has got a lovely margin there by the side of it. Got some wonderful hedgerow trees, slightly wild and woolly hedge, um, just alive with wildlife. This one was a little short hedge in the middle of an arable wasteland. And you know, that hedge, literally, I wish I could have recorded it. It was absolutely alive with insects and small birds, etc. You know, just through that relaxed management. And my last slide is just a picture of English countryside and, and a plea, really, to say, you know, let's not overmanage our hedge, hedges, let's not neglect our hedges, let's recognize the life cycle of a hedge and look after this incredible heritage of ours, the hedgerows of, of Great Britain. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Nigel. Megan, would you like to quickly just run through the hedgerow app that you've developed? Okay, so um, as Nigel said, um, you know, hedges need to be managed on this life cycle. And actually that rejuvenation is a, a key part of how hedges are able to be immortal. 
you know, they, they, they only have a certain lifespan if we don't manage them on this inherent cycle. Um, so, so actually, this this is this is important for for the future of our hedges, not just the, the the condition of them now. And actually, the only reason we've still got amazing hedges, ancient hedges, is that historically they have always been managed on this life cycle. Um, and again, as Nigel alluded to, that sort of stopped um, in more recent decades, just with with technology that's made it slightly um, easier to to manage them more heavily, rather than sort of the the more relaxed approach and life cycle approach that had had been traditional. Um, so what we've done is we've created an app based on this life cycle approach and based on Nigel's sort of ten point scale. Um, so it uses the life cycle as a basis. Um, it's called Healthy Hedros. Um, it's a completely free app um, designed specifically for farmers and land managers or anyone that's interested in, in bringing their hedges back into, into this sort of life cycle approach to management. So it asks just six questions um, uh, and they're quite easy questions. So it's quick and simple to use and it gives instant management advice for each hedge that you survey. So really it's designed as an inform informative tool to help any farmer interested in tra transitioning back to that life cycle approach. Um, the six questions are either multiple choice, such as choosing which hedgerow structure your hedge most closely resembles, or they're like average measurements, such as height, width, gaps, and, and the base canopy. Um, and then all of your surveys get sort of drawn on a map that you can use to help sort of plan your future hedge management. Um, and there's more guidance on the website to help you sort of work out which hedges to prioritise. Um, so this was developed um, with, with thanks to the, the uh, Green Recovery Challenge Fund project. And I'll see if I have, I should have, no, I don't. I was going to show you a picture of the life cycle that sort of um, animates what Nigel was saying that, you know, we've got we've got hedges in all different stages of their life cycle. Um, and through Nigel's 10 point scale, we have a way of bringing all of those hedges back into being healthy, well managed hedges. So it doesn't matter where you start with your hedge, there is a there is a way of bringing it back into that really good condition. So if you're interested, um, seek out the Healthy Hedgerows app, have a look at Nigel's work, um, his 10 point scale. Um, and it, it will really show you no, no matter where your hedges are, there, there is a way of bringing them back into being these sort of beautiful, wonderful wildlife rich hedges. Brilliant. Thanks, Megan. OK, we have a lot of questions for everybody um, and I've tried to group some of them. So um, we've got one here from Georgie. Georgie Gray. Hi, Georgie. Um, and this is for all of us, really, um, what are aspirations would be so how do we think the future of elms can best help farmers to manage these much more valuable kinds of hedgerows in the future um megan do you want to uh, yeah, yeah that? I, can, I can say that so so far we've we've um i know there's been an announcement this morning but i haven't had had time to look into it too much but the details that we've had from the sustainable farming in, uh, initiative incentives um seem a little bit similar to, to what we've seen before I would say sort of encouraging in, um, encouraging relaxed trimming which is brilliant um, what's new about them is that they, they've added incremental trimming as Nigel as Nigel um, spoke about which is a fantastic addition that's not been an option before as far as I'm aware so again just trimming slightly higher slightly wider um, keeps that thick density um, stops you getting that hard knuckle at the tissue line at the, at the trim line make sure there's always flowering and fruiting wood and that's brilliant but I think crucially it also means your hedge is also slowly going through its life cycle. What I would say is from my point of view is is missing so far from from the from the elms um, is integrating rejuvenation into their offer because we've we've now got to a point where an awful lot of our hedges across the, across the nation need rejuvenation you know you can trim it on a three-year cycle is you know whatever it's great for wildlife brilliant but at some point it will need rejuvenation and we've got to that point with most of our hedges so personally i would like to have seen hedge laying and coppicing being more integrated into the tiers that that, that they've that they've set out um so that it becomes a, a requirement at least of, of some of the some of the funding but um we, we haven't seen everything that Elms has to offer yet. Certainly the sort of the second and the third tiers uh, haven't, haven't been fully announced. So hopefully there's still hope that, that that's 
sort of rejuvenation sort of will be will be further encouraged. There has always been grants for it. Um, it's just making it easier to get to. I think personally, I think they've been treated sort of as optional homework up until now. I don't know if that's a fair comment um, and yeah. an optional homework. Uh, you know, we, we know what happens with op optional homework. It's, it doesn't, doesn't always get done. Um, and I would like to see that sort of better integrated into, into, the, into the incentives. I agree. I think you have to make it simple, don't you, to manage whether that's trimming, coppicing, laying, whatever that, that sort of management technique is. I would like to see management plans like you do for woodland management plans. So farmers can plan and then they can plan for the grant. The grant supports that plan. That would be my ideal. Nigel, do you have anything to add to, to that? Absolutely echo Megan's thoughts on the rejuvenation. I think it's absolutely vital. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's, if you had one choice of things to do with hedgerows, then to me it would be rejuvenation because you get this constant mixture of phases all over the country and this the second thing is I, i'd like to see things a bit more joined up like if we look at particularly the arable statistic of only 12 percent of hedges being in favorable condition that's because they're often really over trimmed short so therefore i'd like to find out you know is that a shade issue that more crop farmers are worried about shade and if so therefore we should be offering the options of uh the margins being on that shaded side if you see what i mean just so that so the hedge can go into a more incremental um, uh, regime so yeah just a bit of joined up thinking perhaps yeah okay another question um i think this is more for sort of you nigel um about leaving hedges untrimmed would you prefer to see hedges uh incrementally trimmed or left for sort of two to three years and um does that mean they'll reach a point of sort of coppicing quicker if we leave them you know untrimmed? i'll try and i'll try and answer this in a short way Personally, I really like the idea of incremental trimming. I think it appeals to even people's sense of tidiness, which I'm not trying to encourage people's sense of tidiness, but it does allow people to trim. If you incrementally trim, it might take 30 years, and somebody might say, yes, well, my hedge is going to be really tall then. I would say, yes, but it's going to be a healthy tall hedge, and then we can rejuvenate it. We know that if you cut at the same height, it's going to go downhill on the, on the scale, as it were. If, however, you want to lay your hedge or you want to get wood fuel, then you'd let your hedge grow straight up to, to, to be its height and then opposite or lay it see what i mean so i don't think there's any one given answer for that but mm. don't worry about your hedge getting taller we know it's going to get taller with incremental trimming but at least it's going to be healthy at the end of it brilliant thank you matthew do you um okay. are you looking to do wood fuel you know when they copy hedges or cut hedges what can they do with those with that sort of material so that we're not putting carbon back into the atmosphere if we have a big bonfire at the end of it. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, if we can, if we can use, I mean, I've noticed in the chat, there's been a few people saying about how they cut their hedges and they've used wood fuel that they've gathered, they've been able to use it on, on the site. So I think a lot of people have got an option to use it on the farm as a fuel, um, not necessarily something that they can sell from the farm gate. Um, other other options i would be interesting to see what nigel's take on it i mean traditionally we, we do have some use of um dead wood and brush in, in hedge laying some of it don't we but mm -hmm. i mean can we if we discard the material it's taking longer to break down and burning it but what's our options for you know i mean maybe corners of arable fields there's options there to leave some dead wood piles but you know the, the difficult I, I do know the reality of my sort of suggestion can we chip it you then brought on probably a, a diesel petrol powered chipper onto your site i mean i've done the maths it's still it's still what well, in terms of carbon emissions it's still quite an efficient machine but you have to go and hire another machine bring it onto the site and chip it so be interested to see what really what what nigel's take is on that well, just to say that uh, if you want uh, a great source of information on wood fuel from hedges, then go to the Hedgelink page again. There's a lot of been work, a lot of work been done in Devon. All I would say as a proviso is, don't let that um, production of wood fuel override everything. It's part of a life cycle. It's part of having that biodiversity. You just don't want it as a crop of wood. Otherwise, we'd all be growing willow trees, and there's perhaps not that much biodiversity. But so the, it's a great idea. Getting rid of the brash is a tricky one. Uh, it's an inconvenient truth, really, that you have to manage hedges and, and there's going to be a waste product. But uh, th there is a, a work going on on, on um, a machine that attaches to a hedge trimmer and collects up the 
flail chippings, which would be great, rather than them going into the base of the hedge. Megan. Yeah, I, I think it also depends on scale. I mean, doing them if you're doing sort of one in twenty of your hedges a year, um, and you're not doing you know too, too many. It, it depends on scale, really. I mean, last winter I laid three small hedges. It's tiny scale, but I laid three small hedges around here. Um, I used some of the brush as dead hedging to, to create a wild area in the corner of an orchard. Um, I did chip some of it, but with an electric chipper, but it only goes through tiny stuff with a little electric chipper. Um, and I used that to mulch around um, young trees that I was planting. Um, some of it I cut up as wood fuel, um, you know, just, just for use in a pizza oven um, and and some of it um, I actually experimented with some biochar so you, you can get sort of small biochar um, producing things that can, can be trailed along in a trailer um, and I think I think you can get them as efficient as 70% of the carbon is, is stored um, and that's then a really good way of adding carbon to soil as quite a long-term carbon storage as well as sort of improving the soil conditions as well so so um as as and when the sort of biochar technology sort of increases and we, we get sort of mobile biochar sort of um producing uh, equipment that that could be another option but certainly you know it doesn't all have to be stacked up in a field and burnt anymore we we do we do know that there are other options depending on your scale depending on your hedge depending mm. on your priorities <clears throat> and certainly where deer and uh, are a big pressure which they are in east anglia you need to put quite a lot of that back on top of the cut stools of the deer from hoovering up all the new shoots. Um, so we're coming close to the end now. So um, we've got so many questions and I'm sorry that we can't answer them all through this. Um, one thing that I would like us to just sort of mention is hedgerow trees, which I know Megan, you did touch on, but the importance of hedgerow trees. And uh, one of the questions was, you know, how many trees should we be planting? Um, so when we plant hedges, you know, we mustn't forget to plant our hedgerow, our new generation of hedgerow trees. Um, Megan, have you got a comment on the value yeah. of hedgerow trees? Yeah, <laughs> loads. I yeah. mean, <laughs> for while, <laughs> oh, this could be a whole new talk. <laughs> um, so many values for wildlife, so many values for wildlife. Um, but actually, I think we've also sort of got um, a bit of shifting baseline syndrome with, with hedge trees. We think we're sort of at capacity with hedgerow trees, but if you look at the old maps and see how many we used to have, we used to have loads. I mean, I'm, I'm down here in Devon and we've got, you know, we've, you know, we've got brilliant hedgerow trees down here. Um, and even here, I look at the old maps and go, wow, how many we used to have. Now, they can be a bit of a problem. So um, in, like Nigel said, in, in sort of in the Midlands where you've got enclosure hedges that are all sort of hawthorn, <laughs> hawthorn's a little bit shade intolerant. So if you've got a whomping great oak in your hedge, it can sort of punch holes through it. Um, down here in Devon, we sort of fixed that problem um, hundreds of years ago by having mixed species hedges. Um, and then you've got things like you tend to get, if you've got a big old oak tree, you tend to get things like hollies and hazels and species that are actually much more shade tolerant underneath the tree themselves um, and that actually can really help reduce the sort of shading impact on the hedge. Um, I've got a hedge down here it's 45 meters long and it's got 13 mature oak trees in it and and all it means is that the hedge below does get leggy a little bit quicker which means we have to lay it a bit more frequently um, but actually the benefits that those trees are providing us as shelter um, and, and the wildlife is is definitely worth it. And then Nigel, you were... Yeah, it's just worth saying, you know, even if, if you are in the Midlands with, with, the, with the hawthorn hedge and not a tree in sight, just let one of the hawthorns grow up and become a hawthorn tree, for want of a better word. They say that a one hawthorn tree provides as many berries as 350 metres of, of, of hedge, if you see what I mean. So, and, that, and, and you're producing a song post. So it doesn't have to be a massive, big stately oak or something. Just leave anything to grow up every now and again. And it's... It, uh, yeah. It's, a, it's a really good point with, with tree sizes as well. Like if, you, if you're worried about shading impact, then you can use the smaller trees in your east-west hedges. So, you know, let hawthorn grow up, rowan trees, maybe even okay. field maple, but the smaller tree species in your east-west hedges, because that won't have so much shading impact. And then save your beeches and your oaks and stuff for your north-south hedges. Um, and they, you know, they don't have so much of a shading problem then in your, in your north-south hedges, but they do have like added protection against you know the prevailing winds and stuff so you know added added shelter 
Okay, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to draw it to a close there. We could talk all day about hedgerows and all of it. I'd just like to really thank the speakers for, for giving up their time and doing some brilliant talks. Thanks all of you for that. Um, thank you all for attending. Just a reminder, Hedgelink is the website that you want to go to, which has all sorts of information on it. Um, I'd like to thank you all for your brilliant questions. I'm sorry we couldn't answer them all. Um, but uh, yeah, go to Hedgelink and you know you can you can get a lot of information there. So brilliant. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank, thank you. you for watching.